it's the second Friday of the month, which means another episode of uh, Breaking Cardboard. This is episode three. It's our once a month uh, live uh, podcast, if you will, live uh, v- vlog. And uh, this month, happy to be joined by uh, two great guys, uh, Eric uh, Doty from, from Loop, CEO, uh, who's been on Sports Card Nation. We're going to talk a little bit about what's happened since that January 29th appearance, which seems it's, you know, it's only seven months ago, but it seems like years uh, ago from where the, where you where Loop is now in relation to that. And uh, a breaker, uh, Jared Pfeffer from Courtside Pools, who's a, you know, we'll call him a family member of Loop. He breaks on the platform, and we'll talk a little bit about what he does, why Loop, and, and, and all that other stuff. Uh, if, if you're watching this live and you're in, in any chat, uh, you want to put on the screen in our chat room. Uh, I may put some of those comments on screen and we may uh, interact. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit of hobby too, uh, as well, current events, because uh, it's all pertinent uh, to, to everybody uh, in this room. So uh, with that being said, let me start with, with Eric. You know, like I said, uh, last talk to you, you know, uh, officially on January uh, 29th, Loop was really in, in its infancy stages uh, at that point. And you mentioned, you know, even during that appearance, um, you know, there was moments where, it, you know, it looked to you like it was going to be touch and go, whether loop, uh, was going to even get off the ground. Obviously here we are, uh, <laughs> about a year later. And, and thankfully, uh, those days are in the rear, uh, rear view mirror and come a long way, uh, from, from there to, to now, uh, just recently opened up headquarters in, in Miami, just kind of uh, for those listening, whether they're listening live or to hear this in audio uh, form uh, days or weeks from now, just kind of, uh, you know, where where Loop has went from that January 29th appearance, if you will. So if we talked in January, we would have done <laughs> our seed round um, investment um, so we were just coming out of that in the holiday. Um, so since then, we we did another round of fundraising uh, with a fund called Forerunner out of San Francisco. And in total, I think that brought us up to about 15 million. And that sounds like, I mean, it is a lot of money, but it's really being put into building up our team. And since then, we've just been hiring like crazy. I mean, right now we're, I think we're 14 full-time employees, uh, another five full-time um, contractors, and then we have some part-time as well. So, the, I mean, probably when we talked, I'd be surprised if we had more than five employees. <laughs> so yeah. it's uh, it's grown a lot and we have a lot more roles we're going to be hiring over the next few months. So it's just been taking off like crazy. And then um, obviously we have way more sellers on the platform, including I would guess without looking at the dashboard right now, we probably have six or seven who have all done a million dollars in sales each on the platform. So they've just been taking off and yeah, just it's been great. (laughs) Uh, I mean, if I'm going to say it, it, the short version is it's been great and it's just been growing so fast, faster than I, I, probably ever anticipated it to be when I started this back in March of 2020. Yeah. And I'm watching a major league baseball game and, and, you know, the, the rotating banners, I see that, that loop logo. So uh, mm-hmm. like you said, uh, just, uh, you know, just come a long way uh, doing well, growing literally, uh, you know, as we speak and, uh, or as you speak and, uh, uh, great to see Keegan there with uh, with some uh, you know <laughs> let's go, uh, but uh, uh, to to you Jared a little bit about courtside pulls you're out of Kansas City uh, out of Kansas City kind of how you got your start your kind of your you know your hobby history uh, how courtside pulls came to be what you do uh, and then how you're you got affiliated uh, you know tie that all in there with, with Loop as well yeah so I. Uh... You know, always been a card collector my whole life and kind of always was like 
mainly sticking around the Chiefs and stuff. And then once 2020 came around, I had surgery in uh, on my labrum, so on my shoulder. And and then at the time, I couldn't work because obviously you can't work with torn labrum. This is not fun. But um, so I kind of just started getting in more and more cards. So I was sitting there for my in my bed just resting, and I just started buying a ton of cards and doing all this stuff and getting in breaks. And uh, this is like in January 2020, and then I just kind of went from there and just. You know, I, I mainly was doing this on Instagram because that's how I found out about or found out more about breaking um, and more community esque. And then I started getting into it, and um, then I, you know, did it for about a year and a half. And then actually, I met uh, Craig, who's part of the team, and he reached out to me and basically told me about Loop and what it was about. And and I never, re- I never actually before he reached out, reached out to me. I had not, had not heard about it, and just kind of went from there. And then they graciously accepted me onto the platform, and. Um, and ever since then, it's been honestly the most fun I've ever had in cards. And not just not in terms of like, just honestly, just in terms of the community aspect, it's the coolest, coolest aspect that one could ask for that somebody who loves to be in the hobby. Like if you're you know looking for that, it's awesome that you, when you finally find that sort of sense, you know? Yeah. Are you one? I got I, I want to have just a funny question. Are you one of the, the million dollar men Eric uh, just mentioned? <laughs> I am not. No, I'm not. No. Not yet. Well, you're 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 getting there. You're on your he's way. Still, you're, you know. He's still pretty new. I when did you yeah. start on the platform? You started like three days before nationals or the day of the nationals started. I'm pretty sure. Okay. My first yeah. stream. Yeah, that's awesome, Eric. Just for those that maybe aren't familiar with uh, Loop, I obviously know what it is. Uh, everyone in this room uh, probably does. But for those maybe listening uh, that have you know wherever they are uh maybe they haven't heard about it kind of explain what the platform does what it brings uh to the hobby uh and and that sort of thing so people know kind of what we're talking about yeah so our our business is kind of a, a couple things but probably what most people see is the app and for the collectors, it really is just a place to buy cards. So right now it's mostly live streams. You jump in any time of the day, most hours of the day, there's at least one person streaming up to a dozen or more. And you can jump into a stream, chat with them, chat with everybody else in the in the video and buy cards. And you can buy packs, boxes, singles, what we call market value repack. So we don't do chases. It's Mm -hmm. a thousand dollars on a curated pack by this seller, but you're getting about thousand dollars in cards. Um, And that's, that's the majority of it. And for the sellers, it's, it's more of a business in a box. So let's say you, you're already doing live streaming or you're not doing live streaming at all, but we hand you this set of tools where you can easily live stream using your phone you can list all of the items. Everything is sold in the live video. So your buyers aren't leaving to go to PayPal or anywhere else. And then all the shipping uh, logistics are handled in the app as well. And it's just super streamlined. Uh, and on top of the tools, we offer kind of like a business one-on-one service. So we just have a lot of brick and mortar stores or small bit like a lot of them are just traditional small businesses that happen to be in sports cards. So we come along and say, Hey, we have all this data from everyone else that's selling on the service and we know what works and what doesn't work. So let's sit down with you and actually help you improve your business. And we can walk them through whether it's presentation, product type, uh, time of day, uh, just all the data we have that I'll say like, look, if you, if you make, these few changes, and I can't guarantee a percentage, but for the example, I could say, if you do these, we expect maybe a 20 to 25% increase in your sales. And then from there, maybe you can keep growing. And it's just, it's a service that I don't think anybody really knew we were going to do when we started this. And now it's, you know, I have like one-on-one calls with multiple businesses that sell through loop in the next couple of weeks, just to walk them through the all this information and just helping them make good decisions. And uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of where we are today. <laughs> and we uh, we're building so many more features over the next few months. That's just going to make that even, even better value to sellers. Yeah. I was going to say still evolving. Uh, even, oh, even if, you know, yep. And the nice thing 
uh, is you're on both platforms. I'm an I'm a Galaxy guy, so I have it on on my phone uh, and uh, Apple obviously as well with, with iOS. And you know, one thing I want to uh, hit on what you said is everything's contained in there. So if someone wants to buy into whether it be a repack or break, they don't have to exit out of the app and leave. And a lot of times, you know, it traditionally before, right? Something happens with PayPal, they forget the password, whatever the case may be. Uh, their computer, internet is, is wonky, and then they're just like, ah, you know what, uh, forget it. And you kind of lose the customer through no fault uh, of your own as a, as a breaker or reseller. Now the fact that uh, a potential uh, hobbyist doesn't have to leave the platform at all, it's all done in, internally uh, in in on the platform that's a game to me that's a game changer uh you know on both sides for for the user and and the you know this the seller uh, as well yeah and i think just to add on there the the purchases made before the item is ripped yeah. or or handed yeah. off um there's no rip and hope the person pays you via paypal later when they realize they don't have the money or they back out or delete their account on Twitter, yeah. like all payment happens before the, the actual physical transaction. And I think that's changed a lot of the mentality as well of just accountability and knowing that everything's paid for. Yeah. Uh, Jared, uh, how many nights a week do, do you break kind of uh, describe your, you know, your, uh, what you do on, on uh, loop? Uh, well, I'm a, I try to I try to get four nights a week. Really been kind of right now in the process of vamping that up and getting some help. Um, and uh, would that be another another somebody to come in and help break? And I mean that really mainly also helping with the shipping process. So I think when people think breaking, you just think, oh man, you just have you got you got you got these open cards. It's, it's wonderful. But shipping process. I mean, literally, I think any nobody likes to ship because it's. It's, it's bad, you know, it's, it, it's sitting there over a table and your back's starting to hurt all day after five hours. And so, um, but I do about four days a week. Uh, try to, I mean, I like to do nights because I like to, if there's a, either, I keep whatever game or event happens a day, it makes it more fun to kind of talk about it. But um, trying to start to do more days and stuff. And, but yeah, about, about four for now. Yeah. And you bring up a great point that I, I've said on my show numerous times, but uh, since you brought it up, I want to touch on it again. You know, people think like, you know, breaking's easy. You get the, you know, you get to open the packs for someone else, and that's it. But like you yeah. said, there's a lot of work. You got to sort these out. You got to ship them. You got to package them up. Uh, you got to, you know, keep track of who's or who's. It's it's why after almost 40 years of, of being in the hobby myself, even as I I owned the LCS uh, for seven years, I, it's why I never attempted. Uh, breaking because it's a, a daunting task and uh, you know you got to be dedicated and and good at it you can't there's no 50 percent with it you know yeah, for sure or, it's not like, or you like, yeah sorry. go ahead i always think i just think a lot of people like uh i just think they kind of get the stigma of it's like oh man you, like with shipping as well it's like you know when you're when you're when you're handling somebody else's stuff you want to take good care of it and so like you, there's a lot more to just taking cards and throwing it in a bubble mailer and just because you know you want to bubble wrap those up cardboard those up and make sure that everything's you know not just showing up in just a you know you know what i mean yeah you do you do we'll <laughs> talk about <laughs> we'll talk about some of that and and, and, and you know most breakers do a, a great job uh, yeah at that, a lot but, uh, i'd say 99 percent do amazing yeah job. yeah uh and and you know one thing about this hobby and and you know, we all know, uh, and it's not just uh, this platform, but content creation, uh, breaking uh, platforms, right? It's a sort of a copycat sort of industry. And uh, we've seen people try to come, you know, breaking just exponentially has grown, uh, you know, to, to a crescendo. Uh, content creation, when I got in, uh, you know, in 2018, which doesn't sound that long ago, but in today's landscape, it's, you know, it's a long time ago. You know, there was five or six shows. I mean, I, truthfully, I probably got in at the right time. If I was starting a podcast now with hundreds of them, uh, it would, the, the terrain would be more difficult uh, to navigate. I kind of got in uh, at the right time and sort of 
you know, built up, uh, you know, a listenership, a following, and uh, thankful for that. Uh, you know, just kind of speak, uh, you know, Eric, for you, we've seen, I'm not going to mention them by name, but we've seen uh, other people try to sort of replicate uh, what loop has done, uh, you know, probably do some things. Okay. Some things, uh, uh, not exactly. It's like cloning, right? The clones never exactly as good as the uh, original and Jared on, on the breaking side, you know, we've just seen that, that genre, just, I mean, just crazy, uh, probably less people not breaking. I'm probably one of the, but you know, <laughs> just, you know, I'm, 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 I'm exaggerating there, but just kind of talk about, uh, the hobby sort of whatever it is, just that competition uh, can yeah. be daunting. Uh, even even if you're first, there's someone coming up behind you that if you slip or don't, you know, keep evolving, they're, they're, they're waiting to, to kind of take your place. Just talk about, I don't want to say the pressures of that. I mean, competition's good, uh, yeah. but the, the dynamic of that maybe is a better way to put yeah. it. We, I mean, removing the hobby aspect of our business if you just look at us like a startup typical startup i mean there's always going to be competition there's always going to be ebb and flow to the the market and your success and you know we we just hired a ton of people um recently and we just hired a bunch of new developers so you know we're we're going to be putting the 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 pedal to the floor so to speak and you know, there, there's definitely going to be products that features that re-release that I don't think anybody else is going to have um, ever or for a while. Like we're looking to differentiate ourselves with features that I think just, you know, it's it's what's going to make loop loop basically. Like right now it's, we have base features and people are doing really well and like it and we're going to continue improving it and then, you know, release new features. What I think really makes us stand out beyond you know, again, like there's always startups in any market and there's 50 of them that all do the same thing, but what makes you different? And I think it's going to sound really cheesy, but I think it's, it's our heart. The fact that we don't, you know, we, we have over a thousand people who have applied to be sellers and that's amazing, but we have not added a thousand sellers. Uh, we've, <laughs> we had a couple a week at best yeah. that might accelerate a little bit. And but we choose who is going to stream on the app. Like it's not, you just download the app and you start selling. We look for a lot of different factors. Are you genuine? Are you a good representation of our brand? Like you're not saying a bunch of hateful things or questionable shock value things in your stream. Are you basically set up for scale? So even if you aren't doing a tons of sales now, do we feel like, if we pointed every single loop user to you and you had a crazy night better than you've ever had before, can you handle it? Can you do the shipping on time? Um, do you communicate? So if we have a support issue and we reach out to you to help resolve it, do we think that you'll be professional? And we just go through all that. And then once you bring, we bring you on board, there's a whole onboarding process. And then we help build your business. Like I said, we do those calls if, if needed. Um, to help walk you through ways to improve your business. And we use a lot of data to back up things. Like we don't allow razzes on the platform. Yeah. As for raffles, raffles are technically illegal. I see them happen on other platforms, but I know that for the long-term value and building trust on our platform and doing the right thing, we're, we're not gonna allow those. And I think most sellers, even if they've done them in the past, when they start on the platform, when we hear them, when they hear us explain that, they go, okay, cool, I get that. And they're very respectful of it. And again, that shows the maturity and the prof professionalism of the people we've brought on the platform. Um, so long answer, <laughs> but uh, I think it's really our heart and our dedication to help our current sellers um, succeed to the best of our ability before we just you know, start onboarding a bunch of other people. Yeah, and, and piggybacking off something you said, Eric, and, uh, you know, the fact that you even will consult and have those calls and, hey, let's look at this or maybe if you do this and, and sort of, you know, kind of help, uh, you know, a seller uh, out. It's not just, all right, here's your, here's your login, have fun, see you later, you know. Exactly. Uh, and I'm sure that happens elsewhere. 
Uh, you're a little more hands-on. You care about what you're putting out there. Like you said, you even sort of vet the, the person and, and, uh, and, and, and what the person is about and believes in and uh, does the right thing, that sort of thing. And yeah, obviously you don't want to have to use that authority, but you do have that option if someone uh, is to kind of get off the rails or, or do something unscrupulous or, or not right. You have the right uh, to, to kind of nip that in the bud. Obviously, you hope you never it never happens, but I mean, I'll I'll be I'll be honest. In our so we've been launched for almost a year, and we've removed a couple people because they stopped streaming. Uh, yeah, not even on our platform. I think they just they yeah could, couldn't keep up the business, which is unfortunate. And we remove them from the system because it um, when we do our data pulls, like you don't want a bunch of people sitting there that that haven't streamed. Um, so there's been a couple and we've, um, you know, I'll never name or, or no mm -hmm. hard feelings or anything, but there is one, one seller we removed, um, just because there were some issues with shipping and it, it was not a one-time infraction. It was, it was over time. And I, you know, as a business owner, that was a really tough decision because when we remove them, that lowers our total sales through the system. And I mean, it hurts us in, in other ways. And then we also have to be sensitive to the perception of all the other people that sell on the platform and going, no, if we were ever going to remove you, we would talk to you. And it's not, we wouldn't like just hit a switch and you suddenly lose all your business. Um, you know, that those are things you have to worry about. And, but again, we knew that if we didn't do that, we might lose the trust of our collectors on the platform. And you can just imagine the, the the turmoil in my head, you know, trying to find the right balance and compromises of running a business like this, where the you're worried about both the seller and the buyers across the entire platform. For you, Jared, you you've been on the platform what a couple months now? Yeah, a couple months. How how long have you br uh, been a breaker? Like before you uh, joined Loop? Uh, coming up on my about two years in like the. February of uh, 2022. Yeah. So you're early in the process on both sides, but you're not new, new. Um, kind of speak to, you know, uh, joining the Loop platform, the, the kind of the differences for you uh, as a breaker slash reseller, you yeah. know, whatever. It was, it was honestly like one of the coolest, uh, you know, I wasn't expecting it to be a lot of <laughs> Eric, close your ears for this one. But when I, I remember when uh, Craig messaged me and I was like, and I was talking to my mom, um, and I was like, Mom, I don't think this, I just don't think it's going to work out. I was like, I, there's no way what he told me is true. And he's like, and, cause I, and what, you know, what was already built. And then, uh, and then learning through the onboarding process and then the first night going live and then Craig being there. And then, you know, Eric's always there every step of the way um, in the discords and everything, making sure first one, to, like, it's just really cool having somebody who built something that is also there to support you and not just start, or, Hey, I built this. Don't let it break. You know? Um, yeah. So it, hands so, on. Anyway. Hands on. Yeah. So everything along the way has been super fun. Um, and the, the greatest thing about loop though, and I said this earlier, but it is truly like, I know the phrase is a card show in your pocket, but it's almost more like it's like a, com a community in your pocket because you know, you got different sellers and you got different communities within loop and you get to find out where you like to hang out. And then, you know, a lot of people just like to hang out everywhere. And, and you know, I love to jump in everybody else's live and I know pretty much every other seller on the loop jumped in the lives talking to everybody. And so it really is like something that you get to be a part of. And it's not just like, all right, well, we're opening cards here. If you don't want to open cards, leave. No, it's like, all right, let's talk about what's going on in life. Like, cards are not cards. Maybe it's something funny. Maybe it's something like, Hey man, I got an, an accident or something. And everybody's like, Oh, like I'm here for you. It's just, it, that is the coolest part. And I think anybody that's looking forward to um, breaking on loop is going to realize how quickly that, like how lucky you are to have a community and be a part of community like that. Cause it's, it's, it's truly amazing. If that, if that, that's kind of a question. No, no, I, I hear you. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, the hobby is a community, the tagline for, my sports card nation podcast uh, is the hobbies, the people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, someone, uh, I was on another show this week, uh, stacking slabs and, and Brad asked me like how I love that tagline. It's like, I, if, if you couldn't come up with a better one. How, what's the, what's the story behind that? And I said, it's pretty boring, man. If you're looking for something really, you know, 
earth shattering, you're, you're, you're in for disappointment. When I was just coming, just thinking of a slogan slash tagline, I've just been doing this so long. I just thought about, you know, all the experiences for me, speaking of myself here, along the way, working at the card store uh, at 13, 14 years old, getting that experience, uh, and then doing my first card show at 15 years old myself. Then opening my first LCS at 20, then trans transition into online as that uh, genre grow, and then mm -hmm. content creation. And all those people we meet along the way that are so influential and important to all those processes, right? We're all here because of the cards. That's the hobby. But the hobby really is the people because without those people and stories, um, none of this really actually happens. And uh, uh, so when I, you know, going back to how I came up with the tag, I just was really one of the first things, you know, I just said, what is the hobby besides the obvious cards? And I'm like, it's the people and the experience. And I just, it just clicked in my head. The hobby is the people and, and the rest is history. And, and hearing you talk about that, Jared, with the community, uh, even inside the app uh, itself is just a, a great example of of that and uh, where you can say hey some hey something's going on in my life and if you're uh, uh, you know brave enough to share it and, and people yeah. can kind of talk you through it it's more than the cards like listen the cards are important but it's even it goes beyond uh, the cards and I think that's important and and hearing you kind of talk about that community uh, just you know it just hits home and, and makes all uh, all the kind of sense in the world. I got to ask Eric, when I spoke to you in January, you said I wasn't, you weren't sleeping too much, a lot on your, <laughs> your mind. I guess my follow-up question here these months later, are you getting more sleep at this point? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, no, it's just tough. I, I'm just one of those people that, you know, I, I keep hiring people on the team to take things off my plate. So I was, up until just a couple of weeks ago, I was still doing all support emails. And we finally hired a woman named Ariana to come on as a customer experience lead who now takes all of the support tickets and emails that come in. But even then, there's just like all these things I think about. And next, I mean, you know, I'm sitting on my laptop working. And next thing I know, it's 3 a.m. And I got to wake up for a morning conference call. So uh, it's, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but it's, I wouldn't say it's much better than it was in January. <laughs> All right. Well, you got to get some rest. You got to get some rest, right? Or what I like to tell people, right? Sleep when you're dead. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, Jared, you know, you, you're in that niche, you know, that, that genre, I call it, you know, breaking. It, it's a huge, I, I've said on my show numerous times, it's, it really did save the wax industry, whether Panini or tops or other, you know, uh, brand producers would ever, you know, really admit it. Uh, you guys, uh, when I say you guys, I mean uh, girls and guys that are breaking, uh, sort of, you know, saved, uh, sort of saved the wax. Uh, with the breaking saved, to me, saved the wax industry. I'll, I'll give the cliff notes uh, since I lost a little time. Whether, you know, whether tops or those other, you know, Panini and those other, companies uh, ever kind of really admit that um you know i don't know but I, if truth be told uh it, that genre has uh, now and and now it's it's the big problem is getting uh sometimes the product uh talk a little bit about uh that for you yeah well for i mean honestly i don't think it's like breakers saved it i feel like in general it's like with anything with to deal with technology it's like if you don't evolve with technology you're gonna left behind so i think in general the, the hobby just is, <laughs> sorry i think um i think the community just kind of evolved and then i think to answer your question about getting product um it, it's i mean a year ago it was so much easier to product um versus now um and i i believe that obviously is because a lot more people breaking but um and i know a lot of people have a lot of different philosophies how they break but it kind of is like it's like a give and go you kind of decide what products you want to take and uh some products are like Sometimes, it's, I mean, in the simple terms, sometimes it's not worth it to carry your product if you can't give your customer the, the exact price um, or best price. Then some usually, if I can't do that or close to it, I'm like, well, there's no point. Just won't miss out or or see if we can get a deal later down the line. But I mean, 
there's so many different ways to get product out there if you're creative and get find good deals and uh you know get gets good supplies and good uh product for your customers it just it really is um that's just another part as long as shipping is uh finding product i believe that that takes a lot of time out of you know most most breakers days making sure they're getting good stuff or not just you know find the the first thing they see if that makes sense yeah uh, to eric to to you with, with the loop platform what's been the biggest difficulty if you will you know if you had to point to one thing in 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 general is it, is it just finding the right people to to get it all done or? yeah uh hiring yeah i think i think that's the that was the biggest surprise to me uh after i started the company this is my i've run teams before but this is my first time as like i i run an entire company um the job market um especially in uh development engineering is just really competitive and you know we're still on the tail end of a pandemic and a lot of people are working remote and have different work styles now because we've been in it for a year and a half. So yeah, just, just sourcing people to hire and, and getting through the interview process. It's all, it's all so different than it used to be. So that's, that's been the most difficult. Um, everything else has been, you know, nothing is easy, but I, I'd say that's, that's definitely the, the one that stands out the most. Yeah. Uh, you just opened uh, recently your Miami mm -hmm. headquarters. Uh, I've seen pictures. I haven't been there uh, yet in person. Looks looks awesome. Kind of talk about the launch of that, how that came about, what happens there, and, and uh, uh, where it is uh, for those who, who can get yeah. there and, and check it out. So we have a, we have a retail shop open in Miami. It's in the Wynwood neighborhood, so it's still fairly like right downtown Miami. And I mean, I'd love to tell you that having a retail shop was in the books since I started this thing, but it was one of those things that evolved over time where I knew we were eventually going to have an office and I knew I wanted a video production studio. Um, to make videos in-house as well as live stream. So we were looking around and the more I thought about, the more I realized that a retail shop serves a lot of different purposes for us. It, it, you know, it gives us an opportunity to, to know firsthand what it's like setting up and running in, in local card shop, um, which I think is important when we're working with so many local card shops to actually know what they're day-to-day -day struggles are and and you know there's there's partnerships and opportunities that i feel like having a physical shop actually opens us up to on you know there's there's so many online card businesses now that there's a little bit of extra whether it's valid or not but there, there's a chunk of the hobby who sees a physical card shop and it just changes the way they think about you and I think that's, again, when we think about respecting the hobby and understanding the hobby and working with everyone, it just felt like the right thing to do. And it was definitely hard. Um, I ended up hiring some because I, I run a whole online business and a team. I can't be spent <laughs> running a, a physical local card shop. So I actually hired someone who had, um, I think he had 18 years experience in running shops um, not card shops, um, he, huge, probably the biggest card collector on the team though. <laughs> and, uh, he came in and he's just killing it. I mean, it's, he, he got part, not, he got part-time associates hired. He whipped them in the shape, the, sh like the, the shop displays look amazing. He's handling all the inventory, um, for us. And it's, it, it's just been amazing. And if you, if you live in Miami, you should definitely swing by. Uh, we're running a promotion all month that if you come in and show the app, if you have the app installed, uh, you get 10% off. And we already have amazingly low prices. So you'll you'll walk out with a steal if you if you come in and show the app. Well, someone can buy the stuff and then break it on, on the platform. I'm, I'm... <laughs> yes. <laughs> please, please do. <laughs> it's not but, What's that, Jared? So that's not a bad idea. Yeah, there you go. Sometimes my, 
Every once in a while, my brain works. It's sometimes even <laughs> a little bit better uh, than my internet, uh, believe it or not. But uh, uh, awesome stuff. And, and it, you, it, it, it's funny, my next question, but you answered it uh, uh, in that uh, answer there, Eric. I was going to ask you, was that sort of in the plans? But you said it really wasn't sort of the in the blueprint, so to speak. It just kind of came about as you as you grew the platform. Mm -hmm. So, and again, again, uh, you know, whether those copycat platforms can get to that level just makes that uh, even more uh, difficult, sets you apart, like you said. There is something to be said, like you said, when you have a physical presence besides an online one as well, yeah. when, when you have and, both. And it's worth, it's worth noting that, you know, we did a local card shop because we are a sports card platform where there might be other collectibles that sneak on here and there, but at least for the for foreseeable future, we are a sports card app. We are a sports card community. All the features we build are going to be for the sports card community. And I just want to be super clear. Like you, you talked about differentiating ourselves and you know, the, the heart and the investment in the businesses, but also just we're dedicated to a single market and a community and just we want to do that really well before we ever consider doing anything else yeah that's awesome all right guys let's uh let's talk about some kind of current events it's the biggest probably the biggest story in the hobby and, and the crazy thing uh, we're years away from seeing anything of substance from uh this news but uh you know fanatics uh, uh gets the licensing now for baseball basketball and football. Uh, Michael Rubin, their CEO, was just recently on Squawk Box, a uh, financial uh, news show uh, in the morning, and uh, was very, uh, very outspoken, very forthright, didn't really mince too many words, and uh, very direct, and says they want to do everything in-house. They want to sort of be the one-stop shop. They want to mm -hmm. be direct to consumer. They want to grade. They want to have a vault. They want to have a, a marketplace. Um, they even mentioned when he was asked that the likelihood of purchasing one of these other brands that just lost this uh, licensing. And his, his answer was, uh, quote, most likely. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, really a, a huge, I called it a nuclear bomb to the sports card landscape. But we're not really going to see the fallout. Again, you know, the bomb's been dropped, but we're not going to see the dust settle here for a few years. Mm -hmm. But as you guys know, and, and I know, and I'm, I'm guilty of it myself, we're going to be talking about this all up in the, the, the lead up until we see something uh, of substance. And, uh, you know, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, so me and Tops have something in common. We were both born uh, in the same city. Now, I'm not a, a Tops apologist, meaning... They're, you know, they, they hold some responsibility to maybe why this happened uh, as far as the baseball license go, uh, you know, some customer service issues. Uh, they're not, uh, you know, squeaky uh, uh, clean and spotless. But, you know, I have a sentimental attachment to them from being from Brooklyn, being a huge baseball kid, uh, obviously being in the hobby. And so when I first saw that, that notification come across my phone uh, some weeks back, you know, I had to do one of these, you know, mm -hmm. I run my eyes and I'm reading something wrong here. Maybe it's a smaller license or something else. And so I actually opened the article up, read it once, read it twice and realized, you know, what I, what it really entailed. And it was, it was shocking to me and, and especially being in the hobby uh, so long. And, you know, initially I was disappointed. You know, almost mad. I wouldn't say mad, uh, you know, uh, other than owning some some Mudrix back stock at the time. <laughs> uh, that was the only, you know, skin in the game I had. But I was sort of mad because I got sentimental and I said, man, you know, 70 years of seeing those five letters on cardboard and chrome, we might, we might lose that. Uh, and we might or we might not, depending on – how this all shakes out. If, if, if fanatics buys tops, which is remains to be seen. Um, but the, the old sentimental guy on the porch, you know, 
<laughs> kind of shook me up, you know, and I was sort of mad. I'm like, this fanatics, they haven't even done sports cards before. How, you know, and then when I read they got a 20 year licensing agreement, I'm like, who? Top shouldn't even got 20 years and they've been doing it for 70. I just think that's way too long. And so I've been on my show kind of to wrap this all up and then get your guys' take. You know, I went on my show when, when I kind of cooled down, if you will, took a deep breath and really looked at this from a, an honest perspective. Uh, you know, any, I, I disagree with anyone that says, oh, this is going to be the greatest thing the hobby's ever seen. And I disagree with anyone who says, this is doomsday and it's over. The end is near. The hobby's going to die. Uh, sell all your cards. Uh, get out. Believe it or not, there are people that say, both of those things, obviously not the same people, uh, but there's there's those camps that are, are running with that pennant, that flag. I'm somewhere in between, I guess, would be uh, my answer. I think there's going to be some good things uh, that come from it, uh, maybe better customer service, uh, as I alluded to some issues there. Uh, and uh, there might not be some good things. You know, it's been reported that, you know, fanatics pay 10 times the highest that tops has ever paid so uh, that's a big number and so for people who complain about what wax costs and and whatnot um you know someone asked me i have a a segment on the show where i, I take questions and, and someone asked me will we see wax in your opinion john will we see wax go down and i don't know it's all speculation but if you're t if you're telling me as a as a as a a producer of cars that had to pay 10 times what the previous licensees had to pay. That that just doesn't bode well for the price of wax uh, coming down. And we don't know how many products Fanatics is going to produce. Uh, you know, I mean, Tops and Panini aren't, don't have a shortage of them. There's just so many variables and unknowns, but I don't really see it coming down. And it's, you know, again, there's someone who hasn't done it before yet on their own accord. Now, Fanatics is a, a big, huge uh, company uh, valued anywhere between 10 and $18 billion now. Mm -hmm. uh, has, a, has a track record of direct-to-consumer. You know, I've said on my show, if I'm a distributor, and there's, there's no shortage of those, I'd be a little worried right now, especially with three of those uh, major sport licenses going uh, fall in Fanatics' way. Uh, and uh, so I think there's going to be good and bad. We talked a little bit before we went live, you know, maybe less redemptions, uh, maybe the ones where there are redemptions, quicker turnaround times. Part of the, the, you know, one thing I sort of agree with, I think it's sort of a double-edged sword, is now the players have a seat at the table. They have an equity stake where they've never had to this level uh, before. Uh, maybe they'll take a little bit more pride as sort of co-owners of the brand and uh, so some good things could come out of that uh, but I don't think it's going to be all good and I don't think it's going to be all bad from I, I like to hear both of you guys kind of your thoughts uh, Eric as, as a CEO of, of this <laughs> platform now and and Jared as a as a breaker where this product is is your number one commodity to do what what you do I don't, whoever wants to go first but just kind of your your thoughts and opinion. <laughs> go, go ahead, Eric. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, this is a topic that comes up often when I'm on business calls and everyone, you know, even people that don't work in cards, you know, they know what I do and they're like, Hey, what I read this headline, what does this mean? And I should be clear, like loop, loop is out there to work with everyone. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not gonna like trash anyone because I've, I've met people from every company um, that you've mentioned and, and others that make cards and they've all been great. They all love cards. Um, at the end of the day, I think the news really came down to business. Um, these are big leagues who want to make money and there was an offer put on the table that they like. That said, um, it's years out. We're going to work with everybody we can. Um, and it's going to be really interesting to see what Fanatics does. It's, I think... Anybody who says it's the best thing ever or the worst thing ever, like you said, is overreacting. They, no one knows. Um, there's going to be a change. I mean, it, it's like 
you know, when FLIR stopped being a company. I mean, there's been different periods of time where the product and the hobby have changed. Um, I mean, even the last couple of years, we're seeing the most technology in the hobby that we've ever seen outside of just websites. So it's going to continue to evolve. Um, those companies still have licenses with other, I mean, it's, it's definitely going to change for them. So um, for the short answer, Loop is cautiously optimistic. We're, we're still working with, with all these companies. We're trying to work with them. We're trying to bring new things to the hobby. I don't think it changes anything drastic. And even if it did, um, you know, I've been thinking about loop nonstop for like two years. Like we have other features and other ideas and things that we plan on releasing that you probably couldn't even, like if I, if I gave you an hour to think and list every single idea, there's a bunch of things you probably wouldn't even like get on your list that if I told you, you'd be like, oh, wow, that's, that's incredible. So here we are. We're like everybody else just waiting and seeing, but I, I feel good about it. I, I feel good about the hobby in general, regardless, as long as the people running the show believe that, as you say, the, the hobby is the people. And this is just a fun thing that we all like to talk about and partake in. Yeah, no, no doubt. I, I kind of, I echo that kind of uh, how it's, it's going to be wait and see. Uh, but uh, and, and it's not a utopia, right? There's going to be hiccups, going to be issues. Uh, the people who hate the deal, gonna, whenever that happens, they're going to point to that instance and say, see, I told you so. And when something good happens, the other side is going to say, see, I told you so. Uh, I'm somewhere, like I said, in, in between. Now, Jared is, like I said, is someone where uh, wax and product is sort of the main focal point of, of what you do. You know, what are your thoughts? I mean, again, we're two to three years away from this becoming reality, uh, but I'm sure you're thinking about it, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, for sure. The I mean, they definitely, you know, um, it's a cool, I think it's a cool, exp or it's going to be a cool experience to just be a part of, you know, this is something that hasn't happened in forever. And um, I'm excited. Um, and I know they came, Fanax came in and said, you know, we want to do everything for us. We want to be a one-stop shop. Yada, yada, yada. But I think they say that now. And then they realize once more pieces get rolling, like if you take away, certain aspects they don't want to take away. I think that takes away a lot of large customer bases too, because, you know, say they take away breaking fine. That's, that, that's fine for me. You know, that's not, I'm, I'm still going to be a part of the hobby. It's just one part of the hobby. I won't be a part of it anymore. It's totally fine. Um, and I think that if I don't think that fanatics could do it as successful as the hundreds of breakers that are out there that are doing it and have their own special communities, you know, I, you know, like for the people that like it for the community aspect and for the car. And then, so if, fanatics comes in and rips that away from people like i don't know if that would be a good move on their end but you know i think that they're going to do whatever happens it's going to be there's like you said john there's going to be good there's going to be bad um and i think the coolest part is that we get to experience it and you know the one thing i do hope that happens if i could be like you know if i had to say and if i got a shot i would be like man i'd love for tops to continue with uh, baseball because that's just flagship and i love um nothing against panini because i do have Panini, but i'd love to see upper deck get back in the game for uh, football and basketball and I think that would just be really fun, and um, I think that would just blow the blow the top off, honestly, in my in my opinion. But everybody has their own opinion about it, obviously. Yeah, little segue into that. So there was a rumor going around. Uh, there's going to be a lot of those in the next mm -hmm. two to three years. But one of them was that uh, you know Fanatics was looking to buy Upper Deck. That way, they would uh, procure all four mm -hmm. uh, licenses with, with the hockey. And I had uh, Chris Carlin uh, from Upper Deck actually on this show. He was on uh, with Jeremy Lee. It was me, Jeremy Lee, and Chris Carlin. And Chris made a point. He goes, John, at, at some point during this uh, episode, I, I need to address something. And I say, hey, uh, but, you know, just let me know when. And uh, he took that opportunity uh, literally a month from, from today, a month ago uh, from today, and said, you know, I've heard the rumors. I just want to tell you as someone – who's affiliated with Upper Deck. Uh, to my knowledge, there's no discussion. We're a privately owned company. We're, we haven't put a for sale sign uh, anywhere, advertised that, uh, you know, we're up for bid or, or purchase. And, uh, you know, that's not the intent. Our relationship uh, with the NHL, the league, and the Players Association is very good after many years, and we anticipate that uh, continuing. So, that's that's from Chris. For those listening to this, 
it, you'll, you'll hear him kind of get on that soapbox as he should on episode two. This is episode three, but you know, I, I don't, that's, that's my fear too, uh, guys is one company having everything sort of that, you know, we hear the word monopoly uh, be thrown around. I, I think competition is good. You know, Eric has said that even with this platform, uh, having other people try to you know, replicate sort of drives and pushes uh, you uh, forward. If, if, we don't have other company, you know, my dream utopia is never going to happen probably especially now, but I always said I'd like to see it kind of go back to the way it used to be where you had upper deck baseball, tops baseball. Yeah. Down, you know, we don't have Donruss and Fleer anymore. Well, we have Donruss under Panini's, but, mm -hmm. you know, see more than one company do a licensed sport, you know, and, and other sports. I mentioned baseball, but not just baseball. Um, I don't think it's good when just one uh, brand has the, the market to themselves. I think they, you know, everyone has pride in what they do. I, I, I get that. But when there's no one sort of pushing them for real, I think you, some complacency can, can set in. You know, when you're the only company that has that, you can just say, hey, if they don't want to buy it, they won't get it because we're the only game in town. And, that's not a good place to be. Uh, I, a better place to be is like, hey, we don't do a good job with this release, with this set, with this product. Uh, we that other company's working right now to, to beat us, and uh, if if we let our guard down, uh, we're gonna we're gonna finish second or third, depending on how many. And uh, I, I like to see that aspect. So I don't want to see. You know, even if Fanatics does a great job, and and I still don't really want to see them have everything uh, to themselves. I don't think that's a uh, good long-term. And then when you think about uh, a 20 year license, you know, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I just play one on a podcast every once in a while, but you know, 20 years, like for when I, that's what shocked me the most guys when I read all this stuff was when it came out that these are 20 year deals. How do you give, I'm sure there's some fine print in there, where the league or the players association feels like fanatics isn't doing something right. There's some sort of clause, or I would, I would like to hope so, especially on a 20 year contract. Um, but man, I just said, how do you give, like, I didn't want to want tops getting 20 years. And they, like I said, they've done it a long time. Uh, I think that's a long time to give that to sort of an unknown commodity uh, uh, as far as they've never done this before. Uh, they're not a, a new company but they're new into and in, in what they're about to, to uh, you know, partake in here. And so yeah. that one really kind of made me nervous. Uh, and um, so there's, a, you know, a little trepidation. I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, uh, two words I like to use. Let's, you know, we can, we can, we can play armchair speculator and this is going to happen. And, and that's all it is. It's just guesswork, but, the 20 years, I thought, I don't know about you guys, but I just thought, man, why not five? Even 10 years would have been too long, but it would have little been a little bit more palpable than a 20-year deal. I just think I'm 48 years old. That that contract, I might not even, that contract might outlive me. I might not be around in that contract. <laughs> yeah, that, that's this. too long of a contract. That's 20 yeah. years, way too long. So, especially for a company that's never taken on this kind of, of entity, you know, um, mm. and, but, you know, there's, I'm sure there's reasons for it, but, uh, that makes me nervous and, you know, but, uh, I, I, listen, I love the hobby just like you guys have been in it a long time. I, I don't root against the hobby. That's sort of rooting against yourself. And, uh, I hope fanatics knocks it out of the park. Uh, that being said, like I said, I don't want it to be all four sports, you know, it's three now. I like the, you know, and like you said, Jared, and I mentioned it, you know, maybe work out something with Tops or Panini's where, mm -hmm. you know, some of these iconic brands, you know, uh, from Panini's side, you know, National Treasures, Flawless, Prism, uh, Tops has many of those we could spend yeah, sure. now on uh, naming them. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to see those brands necessarily uh, go away if they don't have to. Um, we'll have to see how this all uh, shakes out, you know, I didn't like everything Michael Rubin said during his, his interview. 
Uh, but I actually did like the fact that he said uh, most likely that they would buy uh, a company. He didn't mention anyone specifically uh, mm -hmm. by name, but I, I got to think. I could be wrong here, guys, but I got to think tops. If, if I'm fanatics and I'm ranking the companies I want to purchase, um, tops got to be number one. The name tops got to be number one uh, on that list. I got to think if it's upper deck, it's just merely upper deck would be. And, and I love upper deck and I love Chris Carlin and, and all those guys there. Best customer service to me in the industry. Um, if it's upper deck, it's because they want that stranglehold on all four made yeah. before but if it's if you know and you know it, it is sort of a hostile takeover uh but it would be a nice olive branch to the hobby to the community to say hey listen we're new as far as doing this we kind of came in and 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 very strongly here and did this uh but we 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 recognize what tops means to to you the collector the hobbyist we it means that to us as well uh we're, we've purchased that brand uh, it's not going away. We're just gonna we're gonna do it our way, and hopefully it's a better way. If you like tops before, maybe you'll like it even more now because we're gonna clean some things up uh, internally that that weren't done right before. I don't have a problem if they say that. Yeah, for sure. That stance, you know. Uh, but uh, I rather see that than them say, you know what, we got the license. Bye bye, tops. See you later. You know, have fun doing. You know, soccer and hockey stickers, and uh, <laughs> well, you know, you can make it Star Wars. I, I think I think it would be sort of an olive branch to the hobby community, right? To to sort of say we know what these brands mean to you, and and we respect that. We're 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 gonna make sure they they stick around uh, sometime longer uh, as well. I think it would be a good sort of you know this is a shock to everyone's system. This would be sort of a hey. We love to have you like you do. Look what we're going to do here or try to do here. Your guys thought any takes on that kind of? Uh... Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I think like they're kind of like, uh, like uh, holding that, holding, holding the hobby's hand a little bit, introduce them, like, you know, stick the toe in. And I think something to piggyback on your perfect utopian with all of the competitors and everybody making product. I think that would be really cool. Say Fanatics comes in and they buy up more than what we think. And they go, okay, Panini, you can make for basketball. These are the products, or you're allowed to make three products, tops for basketball. You're allowed to like three products, and everybody's allowed to make how, or a certain amount of products. And then so they kind of got to be more strategic what they want to release and not say, okay, well, here's 20 products for one sport for you. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. I signed that petition twice. I'll use <laughs> names. You know, I'll just, I'll just keep signing that. But yeah, it, it's, it's, it's definitely gonna, one thing I've, I've said, and I think you guys, this is gonna be interesting. And whatever happens, it's gonna be interesting because there's so many unknowns, so many variables. Some, uh, much of what's gonna happen hasn't happened yet. And we're all we're talking about this ad nauseum now, and nothing's really, you know, uh, physical has has actually been produced, and we're. Where it's, it's a hot button topic. So wait till we get sort of closer. If there's a company that gets bought out, you know, uh, I always tell people, you know, fanatics might want to buy one of these companies, but these one of these companies got to sell to them too. It's a two way street. They just say, hey, we're buying you. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's not that easy, right? They got to kind of agree. Uh, number one, that company that's being sold has to agree to, to sell. And then, then you have to, you know, negotiate what that price is, is going to be uh, in the end. And, and many a times deals don't happen uh, because that price never gets agreed upon. And so just so many things, it's, uh, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't going to be interesting uh, to see how this all uh, shakes out. Uh, I think you both guys alluded to, we adapt, right? As hobbyists, mm -hmm. as, as people who, who transact in the hobby, we sort of roll with the punches. We adapt. We'll figure it out. Uh, we may not like everything that happens every day, uh, but we sort of just adjust and and adapt. And, um, you know, that's the best we can do. Uh, we're kind of coming down the, the line here. One quick question uh, from Rip to Slabs. He says, you have a sports card shop now. What are you going to do in five years when Fanatics goes uh, direct to consumer? Well, I'll just, I'll just answer that real quick from – I'd like to hope um, they don't get rid of the LCS. As a former LCS owner for seven years, they're near and dear to my heart. I think they serve 
a great purpose uh, in the communities uh, where these are, where you can go to your local LCS uh, on any given day and some, some Sundays too, and buy some wax, buy some single cards, uh, buy into a break, transact, just talk shop. You don't have to transact. Exactly, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, that, com- that community aspect. I don't want to lose that. Mm-hmm. And it, it, to me, it would be very bullish. Uh, and I'm not saying they're not going to do it. I don't know what they're going to do. But it would be really bullish for fanatics to say, you know what, we're just going to be Acme and, and, you know, everything. We're doing everything. And screw you, store owner. And, and LCS, and we don't need – thanks thanks for playing. You know, here's your consolation prize. We'll see you later. And yeah. That won't sit well with me. I'm sure it won't sit well uh, with many others. So I hope uh, they don't do that. Uh, I don't – you know, if I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate, I don't think they will. That's that's. There's a lot of card shops that uh, yeah. uh, they'd have to – I think the distributors are the ones that really have to sort of huddle up and figure out sort of uh, what they're going to do here and pivot and, and survive. And, uh, you know, so we'll, we'll see. Your guys kind of just in, in closing, uh, you know, your thoughts on maybe that, uh, especially, you know, Eric now with the store in, in Miami as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think we will wait and see. I mean, that's, that's going to be my advice to everybody. It's there's yeah. just so much speculation, but at the end of the day, it doesn't, change the cards in my collection today it doesn't change the cards i'm buying for my collection tomorrow um and it doesn't change what loop is doing in the near future if at all in the future so yeah i mean that's where i am the the stores always do already doing really well and if fanatics um you know obviously these other companies are going to keep making the other products that they have And uh, if Fanatics works with LCSs and has um, some sort of distribution model, which I would bet that they will, um, yeah, we, we'd love to work with them. <laughs> I'm I'm never going to say anything like crazy. Not I mean I am an optimist when I come about this stuff. Uh, when I look at how things can go, like there's no reason for me not to be an optimist. And on top of it, like we just want to work with everyone. Like it's that's the yeah, you give that's everyone the, that's the, the benefit. Safe, that's the safe. Yeah, well, you give everyone the benefit. Benef- you give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Hey, we yeah, don't know. What, you don't want to just already paint someone what they're going to be like when you don't. You don't know. You give everyone. Hey, let's see what they're going to do. How they're going to be with us, and and hopefully have a relationship. I think that's just that's just smart. Yeah, Eric, kind of your take. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I think of it. This is like I always think of it when I when I hear people also say about the monopoly and like taking out local card shops. I mean, it's just as many people only do breaks. There's just as many people that only go to local card shops. So you take away that from everywhere across the nation. That's like if Amazon were coming and buy up WalMarts and Targets and they take them all out. You know, the people that only go to those stores, it's like, well, I guess we're done doing that. Um, so I think I don't think that'd be a. I think if they if you know, if they want to be a smart or, you know, be the, make the smartest moves, I think they and I think they already probably do realize that, honestly. It's a tall order, and they have a lot of other things on their list. Yeah. It's going to be taking their time and attention, and I don't think that one ranks. I don't know, but I, I'm thinking that's not high on the priority list uh, uh, for Fanatics. I think a few other things are, are higher up there, and uh, so – uh, I, I'm guessing not, but again, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Well, guys, I appreciate you you're coming on tonight, sharing uh, what Loops do in courtside pools. Uh, I always give uh, my guests on any of my shows uh, give out any you know websites where people can find you, download the app where people can find courtside pools. Whoever where wants to go first, you both will have time to give out uh, all those. Uh, Oh, you can find me on uh, you can find me on Loop Courtside Polls on Loop or Instagram or Twitter. Um, yeah, but I, John, I really appreciate you having having me on and having Eric on, and you know, just ha- get, I love chatting about this stuff, so it makes me excited. And um, for anybody that hasn't tried out Loop, uh, you're missing out on a really fun community. Um, even if you never purchase a single card from Loop or anything from Loop, it, it, the community is well worth it. And there are many people on the app that are just there for the community. It's awesome. I mean, he kind of did half of mine. <laughs> uh, just thanks for having me. Um, 
So, I mean, the name Loop, I think, is below my, my name, L-O-U-P-E. So if you give us a search, Loop Sports Cards, uh, it's an app on iOS and Android um, where, you know, we have, we have multiple sellers on most times of the day. And uh, we're continuing to grow a couple new sellers at least every week. So just check it out. And, you know, we're, we're a growing team. You're going to see a lot of new features and improvements come to the app. So I'd say definitely give it a try and reach out to us if you have any feedback. Yeah, and, and like you said, stay tuned. You got you got other things uh, in the pipeline uh, coming up. Uh, mm -hmm. So things are evolving. So again, guys, thank you. Uh, uh, this show is Breaking Cardboard. Uh, we're on once a month. We're actually the second Friday of each month at 9.30 p.m. Uh, usually I have a co-host. Uh, no co-host today, so I just had two guests instead. Two guys, uh, two guys more than me uh, are better uh, than me. So uh, uh, it works out uh, in, in the end. So, uh, again, guys, continued success uh, for both of you. I, I appreciate you, you coming on. Thank you, John. Thank you so much.